Number 10. Damascus Steel. While off on the Crusades, a lot of Europeans came into contact with things they'd never seen before. Spices, for example. Please cut it with the bland food, guys. Please. Another thing they saw were warriors who wielded blades that could slice through floating handkerchiefs, but also bend to ridiculous degrees without breaking. These blades were made from what was called Damascus steel. But for some reason, we actually have no idea what these blades were actually made of, or what the process for making it could even be. Some people think it could have been made by mixing iron with plant matter, which could have given the kind of flexibility I'll never have. But we don't know what plant matter, and we don't even know for sure that's how it was done. Best guess is that it was made of crucible steel, which, <laughs> can I just say, sounds really cool. But that's just a theory. Uh, wait, that's the wrong channel. Number nine, Greek fire. You know what's scary? Fire. You know what's even scarier than that? Someone who can shoot streams of fire at you. While some people love the smell of napalm in the morning, they are usually the people doing the firing. And it wasn't just shirtless Americans who did the firing, no. Somehow, the ancient Greeks also used a proto-napalm that would be used against other ships in naval warfare. The substance would apparently cling to flesh and was impossible to extinguish with water. What puzzles us is that the recipe for Greek fire was never told to anyone. It was a secret on the same level as the Krabby Patty secret formula. People have experimented with different ingredients that the Byzantine Empire had access to. The Mythbusters, my favorite scientists, used naphtha, which is made from a light crude oil, mixed with pine resin, and they burned down a ship in a few seconds. I'm sure at the time, people thought that those who used Greek fire were wielding the power of a god or something. Number eight, the Voynich Manuscript. This may be a little bit insensitive of me, but the drawings in the Voynich Manuscripts kind of look like the same things I used to doodle in my notebooks when I stopped paying attention in class. I definitely never wrote like that though. The Voynich Manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, who was a Polish collector and bookseller in 1912 when he acquired the manuscript. It's from around the 15th century and is written in this really cool looking code with strange drawings. The font actually kind of reminds me of the font from Lord of the Rings. Does anyone else see that or am I, am I weird? A lot of the pictures drawn in the book seem to be plants, but then you get the random page that has a string of what looks like pregnant women and you're back to square one. I don't know, but I'm still going with somebody's encrypted notebook with fun doodles for when they're bored. Number seven, Ulfbort Swords. How do you make a sword that your society did not have the technology for? That is an excellent question, and it is the question that Viking Ulfbert swords pose to historians. The problem with Ulfbert swords is that the technology required for making them did not appear until about 800 years later. Now the thing that kind of bothers me with that assumption is we are assuming that it didn't appear until 800 years later because we haven't found evidence to prove otherwise, except for the swords themselves. In Viking society, a lot of stuff was made with wood and other degradable things, which makes it really hard to know too much about the ancient peoples. What's really interesting is how a Viking sword bearing an Arabic inscription was found. Perhaps these swords were made with Damascus steel, the recipe for which was given to the Vikings through trade, maybe? We need more evidence to know for sure. Number six, Baghdad battery. Do you know how a battery works? Allow me to explain. I don't really know. Um, what I do know is that it involves chemistry. Google tells me the chemical reactions in a battery involve the flow of electrons from one material to another through an external circuit. I don't know. We often think of batteries as a moderately modern invention. And for the most part, that's true. But then there's the Baghdad battery. The Baghdad battery, or batteries because there were a bunch of them, were discovered outside modern day Baghdad in Iraq in 1936. And it's basically a clay pot with a copper cylinder inside of it. Inside the copper cylinder was an iron rod held in place with asphalt. Now, if you take an electrolyte liquid like, like even grape juice or something and put it in the pot, the pots now become batteries generating about two volts of electricity. The crazy thing about this is that they were found in a Paleolithic village, which is like the Stone Age. We have absolutely no idea what the electricity was used for, but probably because it's fun to administer minor electrical shocks to yourself, right? Number five, Iron Pillar. The Iron Pillar of Delhi is, 
Well, it's pretty self-explanatory actually. It's, it's an iron pillar, which is more than 1600 years old. I leave my bike out in the rain for like three days and it's a rusty pile of junk. But this thing has been out in the open for all those years and it never gained a single speck of rust. How the heck is that possible? I don't know. None of us actually know. Some people think it might have to do with the climate in Delhi. As if it was just in the perfect spot to not rust. But then others think it has to do with the phosphorus and absence of sulfur and manganese in the iron. Plus its size. I don't know, my pea sized brain won't be able to tell you the answer, but it certainly is a puzzling one. Number 4. Chinese Seismoscope At first glance, I can confidently say that I would not assume this was the seismoscope. It was basically a big old pot with a bunch of dragons around the outside that would symbolize each direction on a compass. And when an earthquake would happen, the dragon that represented the direction the quake came from would spit out a ball into a bronze toad's mouth. Now, apart from bronze dragons spitting balls into bronze frog mouths, this is an extremely sophisticated device. And absolutely no one knows how it works. We have guesses about what could do it, but this thing can detect the direction of earthquakes 400 miles away. That's insane. And they still made it into a work of art. I am impressed. Good show. Good show. Number three. Antikythera Mechanism I kinda hate when people think complex things in history had to be because of aliens. Just because these people were ancient does not mean that they were stupid. They just didn't have the vast amounts of shared knowledge we have now. Then you show me the Antikythera Mechanism and all I can think is aliens. This thing was probably built around the 2nd century BC and it had the capability of calculating and displaying things like the phases of the moon and the lunisolar calendar. Which is just crazy. We know that people did study that, and gear based tech like this had actually been a thing for a long, long time before it. We think of computers as modern things, but there were machines capable of doing calculations before electricity and computer chips. Some of us have to start giving these ancient civilizations more credit instead of just jumping to aliens or to time travel. Number two Roman dodecahedron. 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 Oh, what? Oh, yeah, sorry, I got a video to make. Uh, here, look at this thing. This is a Roman dodecahedron. And guess what? We have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do. But we do know that Europe has tons of these, and they all date back to the Roman era. Like all dodecahedra, it has 12 sides, and each side has a differently sized hole. They also have strange bulbs on each corner. They would range in sizes too, being anywhere from 4 to 11 centimeters. I'm honestly stumped about what it could be. People have theorized they could be uh, paperweights, toys, candle holders, dice, or even a thing used to measure finger sizes for rings. Let me know what you think it could be. Number 1. Easter Island If you thought this point was going to be about the huge statues on the island, well think again. While those statues are a mystery all on their own, this point is actually going to be about Rongo Rongo. What the heck is Rongo Rongo? Well, Rongo Rongo is possibly a form of ancient writing. What makes it stand apart is that it is almost nothing like any other form of writing from any other culture in the world, at least that we know of. Look at this really handy dandy rock that's covered in the writing. Can you make anything out of it? Apparently, the symbols are based on Polynesian religious motifs. My brain is just a, a smidge too slow to get any kind of information out of it. It just makes me really wish I had a secret language, you know? Number 10 Grid Based Cities Next time you find yourself at 2nd Avenue and East 59th Street in New York and get into a car accident or are just enjoying the pleasures of Manhattan traffic, you can thank the Romans. Also, shout out to New York. Chetty loves you. What's going on, New York? How you doing? How you doing? No, how you doing? Yes, it was the Romans who began to develop cities and Rome into a grid-like pattern. In a time before roads full of cars, this makes sense. I mean, come on, how much space and traffic can horses and carriages take up? There are benefits to building your city in a grid pattern. 
It's walkable, easy to navigate, and you can size up the city pretty well. I play a lot of city builders. I like those games, those games are fun. SimCity. Trust me, I would know. This is also true so long as your city isn't packed with skyscrapers and bumper to bumper in rideshare vehicles. You kind of lose the plot when you get to a big city like that, but they started it, there it was. Number nine, sewers and sanitation. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, and the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Man, I love that quote. Both historical and comical. It's kind of like, I think that's why you guys like to watch me sometimes, right? We'll try it. Well, we'll see. Best of both worlds. Well, it's true. The Romans understood how important sanitation was. While perhaps not the first invention of such, they are the inventors of the modern use of such. The Mediterranean is gorgeous, but after a diet of fish from the sea and pasta, well, you gotta go. One of the ways Romans did this was public bathrooms, except it's more like a room where you and the whole city just do what must be done in front of one another. There's no, no stalls, it's kind of just lined up. It's kind of, it's a, it's a little gross, a little bit. So yes, the sanitation was a great thing, but going together all at once? Well, uh, I don't have to tell you how bad that was, especially, you know, public washrooms. You know how they can be bad, especially with open stalls. That just can't, mm, ah, no good. Number eight. Arches. For the dudes who like feet, this one is not for you. Ain't those kind of arches, dude, sorry. Today I'm talking about Roman arches. Someone somewhere in Rome discovered that the shape of an arch actually makes for a very effective uh, building. I know, who would have thought? You can tell because as soon as they were discovered, they were popping up everywhere, like pimples on prom night. Simple geometry makes complex architecture. Arches can handle their loads, even if they are overbearing. And trust me, I've seen some overbearing loads in my lifetime. Where's an arch when you need one? The arch simply is a mainstay of Roman architecture and a small part of what made up of the magnificent constructions. I'll get more to that on later, you'll see, you'll see. Number seven, roads. All roads lead to Rome. This might sound very stupid, but to us, the Roman roads did change history. Given that there's still Roman roads out there right now that have survived 2,000 years of climate and use, it's pretty impressive. And then there's our modern roads that give in after a couple bad winters in your grandfather's boat of a Buick creating potholes every time he breaks. The roads considered of layers of rock and dirt that made for a sturdy road. Hundreds of civilians, horses, traders, carts traveling back and forth on Roman roads every day. Imagine how hard it would be to get to the next city over with no car and no road. That's some rough traveling. Too bad we couldn't have them back or build our roads today. I've got some denarius for the next Roman to build me a road, baby. Come on, come on over, build us a road. Number six, aqueducts. These are honestly amazing feats of engineering. Even today, it's, it's, it's a lot of bricks to lay down for a little bit of water. So the question is, you build a very busy city, probably the most impressive city and cities of the ancient era. You need two things for all those folks, water and food. Okay, well, we can do farms outside the city walls, no problem, but Water, we need people to drink water and those, those farms need water too. How do you get water to a busy city center? Aqueducts, basically a long bridge that connects freshwater springs to the fountains of the city, essentially running water. This for the time was very incredible. Hundreds if not thousands of years ahead of their time. To be able to walk into town and drink fresh water was a luxury, one that Rome might have taken for granted. Now every home has running water, and it's great and we all love it. You love tap water, I love tap water. Where's my Brita? Number five, Roman numerals. Attack of the math. Look, I don't wanna give the Romans too much credit, but Gosh darn, I guess they did a lot. Sure, we don't use their numbers in regular life today, but they still appear in places once in a while. Uh, like the Star Wars movies, they use them. Uh, they have titles and, and names, and, and, and sometimes just to confuse students when trying to tell time. Sometimes the clocks have Roman numerals on them for some reason. For once, that was something actually I didn't struggle with in school. Who would have thought? The Roman numeral system is based on certain letters representing ones and tens until it gets into larger denominations and more letters get, get thrown in. Basically, anything from one to 1,000, you're good. You're doing great. After that, eh, you're gonna need some more papyrus. I had enough trouble with algebra and adding some letters to my numbers in math class, but now my numbers are actually just letters? Oh, I don't think uh, I don't think so, cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. Nope. I'll be in drama class. Much easier. I'm not going to math class. I'm going to drama class. No. Nope. Number four, the Julian calendar. Imagine being such a mighty and powerful leader that you get a calendar named after you. 
Yes, the Julian calendar is named after Julius Caesar, the man, the myth, the legend. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we don't use that calendar today, do we? Well, as it turns out, we do. Most of the world goes by the Gregorian calendar from Pope Gregory, which was a revision of the Julian calendar. Yeah, I know. I was surprised too. I didn't know that. Wait till you hear where the months of August and July come from. Your boy Augustus and yet again Julius Caesar. Yes, the dude made a whole month for himself and just threw it in there. Okay, now hear me out. We're gonna break. We're gonna break some stuff down here. Ready? Octa, Nova, and Deca are all prefixes for eight, nine, and ten. Right? Just like October, November, and December are the eighth, ninth, and tenth months out of the year. That makes sense. Big prank though. Uh, I got you. Nice try. Because after July and August were added, the others got pushed back. But it's crazy what you can do with a little power. It's crazy. So now October, November, December are 10, 11, and 12. They got pushed back. See, it's crazy. You ever wonder that? See, that's how they did it. It makes. I just. I, there's some people like I actually didn't know that. If I open up your mind, brother. That's what I do. That's what I do here. Number three. The Empire Business. I'm in the Empire Business. Yes, all Walter White and Saul Goodman references aside, also, good show, watch it. When one thinks of empires, the Romans just come to mind. Many have come and gone, and others have had bigger and lasted longer. However, none really had the influence and power of the mighty Roman Empire stretching all over the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and even some parts of the Middle East. Senatus Populus Romanus. She was glorious. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. Years of corruption in government, war, difficulty in controlling its empire from being too big, and just a lack of communication. It takes a long time to get messages around. And maybe the biggest religious reform led to, uh, to the capital moving east and the empire being split to east and west. And then those Byzantine guys showed up and it got a little crazy. There's east and west, and then some Ottomans. It, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah, it didn't last forever. Sucks. Number two, concrete. There's something in that concrete, and this is related back to the arches I was talking about earlier. See, told you we get there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, told you. None of the gorgeous buildings Rome had ever constructed would be possible without the use of their concrete. Using volcanic ash and lime mixed with a base aggregate made for a very tough and durable solid building material. You can even use this stuff underwater. Sounds like I'm giving you guys a sales pitch. It gets tougher as time goes on, and some Roman sites with buildings made of this miracle stuff have little to no wear on the material itself. That's pretty impressive. I spent countless hours awake in the late hours of the night watching dudes make Roman concrete. Am I a builder? No. Am I a tinkerer? No. Should I have been in bed? Yes. However you look at it, it's just cool stuff. There's some cool videos out there. It's really cool stuff. But it like lasts forever. Like the, the buildings are actually gone, but like the concrete itself, dude, you could use it again. It's no like it's it's insane. It's just where do we go wrong? Number one, entertainment. Show business. <laughs> After bread and wine comes entertainment. Okay, no, they didn't invent fun, because Romans probably had a different idea of fun than we do. All you have to do is look at the Colosseum and some of the other large sports event centers they built. Yeah, it wasn't just the Colosseum in Rome, but across the Roman Empire, there was more. Why? Because they needed to be entertained. Gladiators, lions, fights, you know, you know what was going on. There's always been actors, storytellers, but it was the Romans who made it theatrical. If you ask any acting teacher, that's gonna tell you what counts. The theatrics. Starting our list off at number 10, VR. Okay, I recently got an Oculus and I felt sick a lot. I was so dizzy right off the bat. The game's super hot where you have to like throw items at bad guys. I actually got anxious. My palms were sweaty, my heart was racing. Olivia straight up cried when she tried it. It was a wild ride. This is pretty powerful technology. Black Mirror, of course, has toyed with how VR could go wrong, but The Simpsons also predicted its dangers all the way back in 2016. The episode titled Friends and Family has the town of Springfield excited over this new VR tech that's finally arrived. They're so into it that eventually people are walking in the streets while wearing these headsets. They're bumping into walls, they're smacking their heads, they're ignoring real life obligations. Cut to now with Facebook going the virtual route recently with the introduction of the metaverse, I believe The Simpsons actually undermined the dangers for this one. Yeah, you thought pop-ups and sketchy links were bad for your family on Facebook? I don't know, soon we're gonna be walking into virtual pop-ups. That's gonna be pretty alarming. $3 billion worth of VR was sold during the pandemic alone. Connecting during times like such can be vital, but how far is too far? Which room am I in? I'm in the laundry room, like sword fighting someone. I'm like, what am I doing right now? Number nine. Drones. I mean, sure, drones can deliver packages now in like 13 minutes flat, and sure, they can fly through bowling lanes in cinematic fashion, but could drones be so advanced that we're actually mistaking them for alien aircraft? 
Possibly. We don't know how advanced these things are. We have no idea. Not even the military. Back in the early 60s, the CIA had this secret program called Project Aqualine, where they used these small drones with a low radar cross section, a little camera, all that spy stuff. And it was disguised as a bird, believe it or not. The first prototype was a bit obvious. It weighed over 100 pounds. It was this massive eagle looking thing. But the only way to catch the drone was to fly it into a net which broke something almost every single flight. Cut to 2022, it looks a little bit differently. Now there's like a bird conspiracy. People don't even believe birds are real and there's for sure a drone pigeon out there somewhere. Number eight, 3D printing. This is something that did not exist when I was younger at all, in any way, shape or form. All we have were those spider markers that like connect the dots that are like kind of sticky. That was it, that's the closest we had to 3D printing. Now people are printing swords in their basement, I don't know. Connor on our gaming channel, he printed a Pokeball and it looks awesome, it's a real size Pokeball. Now he has one of those, because he printed it. It's becoming increasingly popular as they're becoming more accessible. Unlike the traditional printer, 3D printers are able to print and create these three dimensional objects on the spot. It's fascinating how fast it works. This technology is continuing to advance and some printers now have capabilities of printing out food and even organs. So that's great, but again, where is this all going? How far are we gonna go? Sounds like it's a kind of a bad idea. It feels good, but so does everybody in the first 20 minutes of a Black Mirror episode. Know what I mean? They're like, oh, this technology is fascinating. And they're like stuck in some virtual matrix for 40 years. Number seven, smart TVs. Survivor, season 42, episode five. That's it, that's how easy it is right now. That's where we're at with technology. Remember TV guides? That's gone. Ask your parents about TV guides. Just watch them, watch the trauma return in their eyes when you ask them that one. I didn't know this was something that people were worried about until I looked into it. I love my smart TV. It's got all the apps. I can speak into the microphone instead of using the terrible prime search function. I don't need cable as well. It solves so many problems and the picture is great, but not everybody feels so on board with these smart TVs. Apparently smart TVs are so smart now that they're also keeping tabs on users' viewing habits, which viewers are worried will somehow allow criminals to hack in and then steal their personal information, which more than fair, this is a new technology. I have no idea how to do it. My dad has no idea how to use the smart TVs. Oh my God, that's a, that's a nightmare all the time. There might be something that I'm missing, but do I want to find out? No, I don't know. Imagine someone hacking your TV in the middle of the night. Anonymous just appears. That'd be so haunting. I would not want to get out of bed. Number six, Google Glass. Smart eyewear technology, that's cool. You want to feel like Tony Stark? Sure, I get the idea. Ideally, when it's worked out, this pair of shades can make you a little bit of a superhero, okay? It's able to display information and content in a similar way that a smartphone would, only, you know, hands-free. It would be only voice control, wearing a heads-up display like Google Glass or even a modified version of VR. Now or later, I don't know if I'm on board, to be honest with you. These can contribute to eye fatigue and may cause visual confusion. And also, this may mess with your memories, scientists say. You get a pop-up in the middle of your kid's first birthday and your whole memory is just ruined forever, you know what I mean? I don't want that. I don't want a computer or notifications anywhere around me. My phone's bad enough, let alone Google Glass. Middle of a conversation, a really dirty pop-up comes up. You're getting coffee with your parents. You're like, uh, close, please. Number five, self-driving cars. If you own a Tesla, First of all, nice. Bravo, must be nice, that's great. But comment down below how often you actually use the self-driving feature. I imagine that it's terrifying. I don't know if I could ever use that. Just click it and just, okay, <laughs> hope it works. I watched this body cam footage the other day online of someone being pulled over in a self-driving car because they were asleep at the wheel. They were, they were asleep, but they were driving, well, the car was driving, but they were having a nap. They were on their way to work asleep. You know what I mean? This is where the line gets kind of hazy. Do we want this technology to go further? I don't know. I kind of want people awake on the road. Call me old school. I mean, there are plenty of reasons why this feature makes sense, why it could be exceptionally helpful, and why, you know, there are people who are clearly on board with the idea, but there are also some things that are rightfully a major cause for concern. One of the most debated and truly one of the biggest questions surrounding this is an ethical one, like will a self-driving car prioritize its driver over other road users in any given situation? Know what I mean? Something happens, who's it gonna prioritize? Someone you're about to hit, it's gonna prioritize you. How do we make those real life decisions? We don't, well, we do, but computers, they don't. Number four, robots. 
Oh God, here we go. We're at a point now where robots can straight up do parkour. Boston Dynamics is trending every other week. Half the time I can't tell if their videos are real or fake. These robots are just too impressive. Sophia the Robot. Yeah, she's been on talk shows. She's a fun time. Let's talk about her for a bit. Sophia the Robot is the first robot to ever receive citizenship from a country. Can you believe that? She's legally from Saudi Arabia. Sophia is a citizen, and this robot citizen was on talk shows saying how she wants to destroy humans. And then everybody around on the talk show laughed and went along with the bit. Could this slowly be underway? Is this a marketing ploy? I don't know, either way, I don't like when robots say Again, hey, call me old school. I don't like when robots do shit. Number three, flying cars. Where we're going, we still need roads. Ideally, Marty, let's do it. Even scarier than self-driving cars, cars that fly. I never want this, personally. I can't even parallel park now, let alone in the air. Know what I mean? This idea started to get real back in 2017. You may have seen it online. The concept of a futuristic hover car was revealed officially. It was called the Renault Float Car, and it wasn't as cool as we thought, but it's a step, definitely a step forward. There's numerous companies working on a floating car right now, and to be honest, by 2024, we could actually see these things on the road. So heads up or forward, I don't know. Just stay awake on the road, just drive, please. Number two, mood rings. Okay, for these last two, we're gonna jazz it up a little bit. I'm gonna pick two inventions that thought they changed the game, but really, they didn't at all. This 70s invention was a real gem. Pun, we got it. The mood ring, as far as fads go, not the best, not the worst. It's nothing like our number one spot, but it's, it's quite close. The stone that would change its appearance due to your body heat. That was the, you know, the magic of it. But some folk actually let this ring make decisions for them in real life. The mood ring was the bee's knees all around town. Joshua Reynolds and Maurice Ambats created them in 1975. They added some love, or some lies rather, to the mix, and now we got a popular fad. Yellow meant that you were nervous. Blue meant that you were relaxed. And red obviously meant that you were mad, right? Of course, ugh, take your ring back and your $8. They sold 40 million rings in just a few months alone, making around $20 million in sales. All for a ring that just likes your body heat. My mood ring says that I'm angry after hearing that fact. So let's move on. Finally, number one, silly bands. Oh boy, where do I even start with these ones? I remember taking part of this craze when I was in high school. I had like 11 of these all wrapped around. Zero circulation, but you know what? I was cool. They were literally just rubber bands, rubber bands that made a silly shape. And most of the time, the shapes weren't even that silly. It would just be an anchor or a hammer. That's, that's not silly at all. The same team that made the Lip Strong bracelets were responsible for silly bands, and by 2010, thousands of stores were selling them. It was hot, you couldn't even buy these things, honestly, they were sold out, I remember. I was part of the mob trying to get those silly bananas. Classrooms had to ban these because they were too distracting. How embarrassing is that? The iPad came out in 2010, yet they had to ban silly bands in the classroom. We love it. Silly bands made over 100 million a year. I'd say it's worth it for that guy. The guy's swimming inside of his house now because we wanted the dollar sign shape wrapped around our wrist for some reason. So you know what? He got us. Eat the rich. I'm like, yeah, eat the rich, but stop buying silly bands at the same time. Know what I mean? Number 10 in the countdown is the kayak. Its true name is the Hayak. But foreigners didn't know how to pronounce this word, and when they read it, they dubbed the one-manned boat a kayak. The Hayak was used for over 2,000 years by the Inuit, with the exception of those in the most northern regions. A little too cold for it there. This small, narrow boat was created by the Inuit in the Arctic region of Canada. It's a piece of ingenuity. The cockpit was closed to avoid the pass from sinking if the craft were to capsize, something that was completely unique at the time. These crafted transportation boats were created with wood or whalebone frames and covered with stitched seal skin or other animal pelts. They were perfect for the transportation of goods, travel, and hunting, allowing Inuit means of exploring Arctic geography and landscape while also accessing natural resources and other communities of Inuits. Oral tradition tells us that this was not only an item of practicality, however, but also one of personal growth and connection to self and community. Community. Today, the kayak is used by many for leisure, sports, tourism, and competition. Number nine is baby bottles and formula.
gorillas. The baby bottle has been found in a few northern indigenous clans histories, Iroquois and Seneca being the prime examples. The baby bottle of the past is drastically different from the plastic and silicon model found in stores today. Water skins were used by ancient Egyptians and global indigenous colonies alike, but the indigenous inventors made some changes so as to use them to accommodate babies. First, they did not use goat skin like the Egyptians, but rather the dried then greased bag shaped stomachs of their large prey like boars, bears, and buffaloes. Secondly, they learned to attach a bird quill on the end of the intestinal piece to act as a nipple to create the first baby bottle. According to the Iroquois historian Arthur C. Parker, the intestinal tube would be filled with a mix of pounded meats, berries, and nuts. It was cooked until the mixture inside turned into a warm paste or liquid. Another baby food or milk alternative was corn and water mixtures. Number eight was better when we didn't have to pay rent for them, it's apartments. Indigenous colonies around the world executed the same idea, many people residing in the same building, but in different ways. In southern America, the Anasazi may have moved south after the warfare decimated their population, but their historic community still stands. The Anasazi were masters of the humble yet expansive identical apartments. Before the arrival of Europeans, indigenous peoples in Canada had their own building traditions. Differing from nation to nation depending on their purpose and function, the building traditions reflected the important aspects of indigenous peoples' cultures, societies, geographics, environments, and spiritual beliefs. In eastern woodlands, Iroquois, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and others, characteristic dwelling was the longhouse, a metaphor for life wherein families gathered and ceremonies assembled. It looks as it sounds, long and narrow in structure and meant to house several families related through the female lineage. A village would oftentimes be a group of these longhouses surrounded by pole-based fences. Another example is the wigwams, which was generally housing one to three families and were used in eastern woodlands and subarctic regions. Wigwams were able to be disassembled and reassembled for those who moved with the season or with the hunting. Imagine that, you hate your neighbor, you can just pack up your whole house, head out. Number seven, let's check out the raised bed agriculture. One of the most famous examples in the Inca dynasty, historians and archaeologists were mind blown to discover the Incas understood water irrigation, underwatering, floating farms and gardens, and raised bed agriculture. The indigenous of South and Central America invented the technique of enriching soil and piling it to build raised garden plots called chinapa on swampy land and in lakes, a forerunner model now used for modern vegetable farming. Well, this practice spread from Mesoamerica to other indigenous colonies of South and Central America and then further. The Three Sisters, which are corn, beans, and squash's method of growing, showed up along the East Coast and Great Lakes of Canada. The raised beds allowed for control over the growing environment, something that wild planting could not. But unlike that style of row agriculture, the three plants were allowed to grow together, creating a microenvironment for ripe growth. The sisters were only to be segregated by blocks and mounds to keep them free from weeds. Scared of heights? Number six isn't, it's suspension bridges. That's right, in ancient, ancient times, people were constructing bridges. Wanna get stressed? Let's talk about the materials used. In South America, the Inca figured out how to weave certain mountain grasses and other plants into thick ropes that could be used to make bridges. The Incas were the only pre-industrial American culture to invent long span suspension bridges, said to have rigged 200 plus bridges across gorges and cliffs. In another rugged region, the Himalayans seemed to independently develop suspension systems at pretty much the exact same time, albeit they were different. But the Europeans didn't have the know-how until several centuries later after the Inca Empire fell. Embarrassing. Northwest BC is home to some suspension bridges made of wood systems. The best known is the bridge over the Buckley River at the Hagwagat Canyon. The design theory is similar to that of the Inca and Himalayan, the strongest point extending outwards from the edges and then a gangway tied to join the two halves in the center point. The physics of these historic bridges was something European and American engineers copied for our modern bridges in the early 20th century. You can visit the last standing suspension bridge made by the ancient Inca of South America in Peru, Canas province. Dare you to walk across. Number five is the first syringe. Hello to our pre-Columbian friends again. You guys were killing it in the invention game. Indigenous of South America were known to have fashioned a syringe using animal remains. Like with the baby bottle, a sac-like organ was used to hold the liquid. In this case, the choice was smaller animal bladders. Next, a hollowed bird bone with a sharpened tip was attached and used as a needle. How on earth did indigenous peoples got called primitive is beyond me. The ability to even recognize medicines, make them injectable, and figure out the knowledge of the body in prehistoric times enough to know what would happen should it be injected and where, frankly it's remarkable. In fact, the syringe didn't show up in European medicine until the 1850s, when Scottish physician Alexander Wood thought 
maybe using needles to inject more could relieve pain. Right. And what medicine were the indigenous colonies using in these syringes? Number four is anesthetic medicines, topicals, oh my. Traditional medicine is part of cultural legacy of indigenous peoples and their purpose for more than 2,500 plant species. Like the Takana and the Leko who use quinine, cat's claw, and avanta, all plants recognized by modern pharmaceutical industries. First Nations used olefin, hydrocarbons, and methane to make petroleum jelly and used it to hydrate and protect animal and human skin. The Amazonian and Andean indigenous people of South America pioneered the use of a variety of medicinal plants to manage ailments. An example of this is ginger. We currently use it to flavor dishes, but indigenous healers prepared it as a medicinal drink to relieve pain or reduce inflammation. Another remedy for pain and inflammation was black willow bark. Once it gets into the body, salsin produces salicylic acid, the active ingredient in modern aspirin tablets. That's right, they produced aspirin. And in modern day Virginia, Jimson weed was ground and used as a plaster on external injuries and bruises. It could be injected or ingested as an anesthetic while broken bones were set. There are even treatments for hemorrhoids, suppositories made from dogwood trees, a material still used medicinally today. Oral contraceptives were invented when the Shoshone and Potawatomi used herbs like stone seed and dog bane to prevent pregnancy. I swear I could make an entire video about the medicines and remedies invented by indigenous people, many of which were also the first ways to brush teeth, cleanse breath, heck, even the first sunscreen was invented through indigenous healing practices. It's truly unreal what was accomplished and I personally recommend sweet fern tea for your next stomach bug or hangover. Rubber is number three and no, not the contraceptive. Many don't know that natural latex is derived from plants and trees. Many also don't know that the Aztecs, Olmec, and Maya of the Mesoamerica are known to have made rubber using this natural latex. It would be harvested from rubber trees and mixed with the juice of morning glory vines. These two plants ironically would grow very close to each other. So it's believed that's how ancient civilizations stumbled across the vine's fluid containing a chemical that solidified latex so it wouldn't be brittle anymore. Depending on your latex to vine juice ratio, your rubber could differ. Some came out more bouncy, like a rubber ball used in the famous Mesoamerican ball games. Other combinations created durable leather, which was likely used for homes as well as for sandals, which were described by Spanish conquistadors that have never been found by archaeologists. When you look into Aztec civilization, it's not a surprise that they were making advanced rubber they truly had the spirit of scientific inquiry. Number two is I can't hear you. Thankfully, that was no concern to the indigenous peoples, as when speakers of one language met those of another in trade, council, travels, or conflicts, they communicated in the then universal language of hand talks. It's dated past 30 years old and observed among Florida tribes by the 16th century Spanish colonizers. This is considered one of the oldest languages in North America, without a word ever being spoken. Though universal in North America, hand talk was more prominent amongst the nomadic plains nations, earning the modern day title of Plains Indian Sign Language or PISL. So if sign language was around for this long, why didn't you know and why isn't it a worldwide language like English is? Two reasons. One, by the late 1800s, tens of thousands of indigenous people still used hand talk, but that changed when the federal government and Catholic Church initiated the erasure of indigenous people and culture. This destroyed the communities and history for decades to come. And two, in the 1870s, and 1880s, fierce opponents of sign language called oralists were led by the apparent Canadian legend Alexander Graham Bell on an ableist mission to ban sign language and force hearing impaired people to communicate by lip reading or learning to speak because it was apparently more convenient for everyone else. He rightfully failed as ASL and indigenous hand talk are still recognized and used to date. He did introduce some new techniques some hearing impaired people just prefer more. McKay Cody is the first deaf researcher to specialize in North American hand talk and today helps work with indigenous colonies and tribes to help preserve the original sign language. She's also pushing for PISL to be rightfully incorporated into mainstream education of ASL. At number one in the countdown, no it wasn't the Greeks and it wasn't the Romans. How indigenous democracy made the colonial world. The Haudenosaunee Confederacy of what is now upstate New York developed a democracy made up of six nations, with each tribe taking care of its own governance. Consisting of 117 rules recorded on strings of wampum beads, the great law of peace, an oral constitution, was designed to help the Haudenosaunee live in harmony. Dating to his 
early as perhaps 1142, this charter is based on community unity, liberty, and equity. It even provides for the separation of powers and outlines impeachment procedures. Should any major issue arise in a tribe that was of interest to all tribes, the six would convene in a middle point and make any decisions together. Beside vesting the community with the power to choose its leaders, a right which at the time may have been unique in the world, it was even described that the ideal character of those leaders was a servant to their people rather than an overlord. You were to lead with empathy, honesty, bravery. The United States of America traces its political roots to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, but by then democracy was old news in the so-called New World. During the American Revolution, thousands of indigenous already lived under a system of governance. So as the Founding Fathers began crafting a more perfect union from scratch, they followed the example of the Six Nations. This is documented in letters written by George Bush, but also acknowledged hundreds of years later in 1988 by American Congress, who said the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was influenced by the political systems developed by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, as were many of the democratic principles which were incorporated into the constitution itself, a constitution that the indigenous peoples would be left out of. Kicking off the list at number 10, astronomy. You ever want to date somebody, but they're a Libra and you're a Gemini? Oh, ain't that the worst? Look, dating apps even have this now as a feature. You can write down what your symbol is, like, hi, I'm Kyle, I'm a Leo, and I love waking up early. Those are real bios for real people, and we have the Mayans to thank for all of this. The Maya studied the stars. They were the pioneers of our calendar, which I'll explain a little bit later on, but they also created lunar months. They figured that 81 lunar months added up to 2,392 days, meaning that one lunar month is 29.53 days, incredibly close to our modern moon month, which is crazy. They nailed it that long ago. They also studied Jupiter, Mars, and Mercury. They studied where each planet travels to and when. If you're a Libra, like me, smash that thumbs up. I'm a late Libra too. We're just trouble. We're the worst of the worst. Number nine, the Mayan calendar. It's 2022, which means the world thankfully did not end in 2012, but the Mayan calendar predicted that on December 21st, 2012, apparently it would be this massive doomsday. No, no meteors hit. That was all false. That wasn't a real thing. Thanos didn't snap any of us away. Nothing like that happened. But that day did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner, okay. The Mayan calendar is extremely accurate. Their calendar is 10 thousands of a day more exact than the calendar that the world uses today. They're that precise. We have leap years and stuff just to try and correct it. They used 20 day months and had two calendar years. They had a 260 day sacred round and then a 365 day year. Every 52 years, these two calendars would coincide with one another and this was referred to as a bundle. Imagine if we still had this now, that'd be so confusing. But 10, Nine, eight, what are we saying? Seven. Number eight, chocolate. When I visited the UK, the, the first thing I noticed was how much better your chocolate was. So good. I'm not sure what y'all are doing over there. Maybe it's just made with love. Who knows? But I'm a huge chocolate guy and the UK nails it. Yeah, wash it down with some iron brew. Buddy, what a day, what a great day. The Mayans as well, turns out they loved chocolate. The old Mex of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, but the Mayans made it beautiful. They added some spice to it, literally. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water, chili peppers, and honey. They would make a spicy drink. Are you into this idea? Is this making your lips happy right now? Spicy chocolate drinks? My tummy can barely handle a pumpkin spice latte, let alone a Mayan milkshake. No, thank you. Number seven, glyphs. Glyphs at number six, six glyphs. One of the most advanced forms of writing when it comes to all these ancient Americans, the Maya were the most ahead of their time. They invented the glyph, which are these symbols that represent a word or a sound. Like anything else in this civilization, it's beautiful to look at, of course. The Maya used around 700 different glyphs. They're detailed, they're beautiful. A good amount we're able to translate today, but there's still a mysterious chunk that we're trying to figure out. The earliest glyphs engravings go back to the third century BC, meaning that the Maya are the pioneers of writing in Mesoamerica. There are only a few civilizations where writing naturally occurred. The Mayans, ancient Chinese, and the ancient Mesopotamians. Number six, math. One of the earliest uses of the number zero being in mathematics came from the Mayans. Thanks, awesome. They were super advanced in their mathematics, I would say for their time, but no, in general, they were advanced. We're still trying to understand how they achieved what they did without calculators. It's impressive. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. They didn't have much to work with here, yet somehow it was still enough. 
The Maya numerical system only had three symbols. This was long before Bedmaz was born. They had zero, one, and five. That's it, you could literally count on one hand. There's a shell shape, a dab, and a bar. These numbers went from zero to 19, and then they would count groups of 20. By the time 36 BC rolled around, the Maya were introducing the concept of zero into their numbering system. Thanks guys, I failed math twice because of those zeros. Cheers. Number five, rubber. Rubber is a fundamental. I mean, sure, the long-term effects for rubber are questionable in turn. Now we have literal pits full of tires, but where did it all begin and why? The Maya created art, they looked to the stars and made calendars, but what did they do when they wanted to have a good time? Mayan meals were composed of maize, squash, and beans with tons of crops. Turns out the Maya were the ones who created elastic long before Mr. Goodyear over here. They made elastic from latex by mixing it with other plants. They really created bouncy balls, if anything. They took latex from trees and mixed it with vine juice. This was around 1600 BC, and you can't invent rubber balls without creating some. Number four. Ball games. Yeah, imagine inventing a bouncy ball. You can now create any game you want, any rules. You'll never lose again. How great is that? The Maya have pretty impressive ball courts. These games were all but fun, honestly. These were religious events. These games would last around 20 days on average, so I hope you warmed up that harm because you're gonna be here for a while. The pressure was always on also from the overlords as these courts were built at the bottom of a sanctuary. Yeah, hey, no pressure, but uh, your ex is here with Zeus. Break a leg. The go-to game was called Pocket Talk or Hodgepodge, and you had to throw a heavy elastic ball through a hoop. Instead of fist bumping at the end of the day saying good game, good game, good game, the losing side would either one, not survive, dark, or they would have to give over all of their belongings, which also sucks. Yeah, a 20 day game, and then you'd lose all your stuff. That's horrible, what a horrible month. Number three, art. Of course we have to mention art. I'm not saying the Mayans invented art by any means. Each of these ancient civilizations had their own way of expressing the afterlife or life in general. Art was just everywhere. The Mayans specialized in decorating stone landmarks. There's only a handful of woodcut art pieces, but the most popular are these stone pieces from Copan and Carigua. They're extremely complex as well, obviously. Look at these. Rock climbers couldn't even get their fingers in these greaves, you know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. Yet somehow people made them. These zoomorphs here are giant rock sculptures created in the shape of animals, which are always fun. And of course the Mayans are also famous for their wall paintings dating back to 200 BC. One of the most well-preserved is at Bonampak. Look at this, this is incredible. We often look at Egyptians and their art, but this is incredible too, often overlooked. Number two. Laws. The Maya made their own ball games. They made their own rules. They made chocolate their own way. But they also created law and order. In a time where food and shelter was sparse, you would think it would be a lot like the Dark Ages. Just a bloody mess, you know, full of thieves and bodies and bad stuff everywhere. Well, when you're the first civilization to create the death penalty, everybody is pretty well behaved afterwards. More than fair, yeah, fair. Taking the life of others was uncommon because of these harsh laws. I mean, you remember how those ball games would end, right? Yeah, imagine crimes. If you were to take the life of another, say you lost a ball game, all your goods are now gone, you react in a horrible way, well, who comes knocking at your door asking questions? Who says you're now a suspect? Sherlock Holmes? No. Say you live with somebody and they commit a crime. Well, not only are they now gone after they get caught, but the victim also gets your land. They get all your goods, cattle, your home, everything. So whoever lives with you as well, well, you better pack your rubber balls. You're out of here. You don't live here anymore, thanks to Good Game Gordo over here. I'm glad certain things stuck around, like the law and order part, but uh, imagine being evicted because your roommate stole some beans. God damn it, Craig. Don't do that. And finally, number one, the underworld. Also referred to as the place of fright. Okay, save the best for last, we love it. Zibalba comes from Mayan mythology. Overseen, of course, by the Mayan death gods, Zibalba came to be in the 16th century Verapaz. The entrance to such a wonderful place was in the cave of Guatemala. So, splunkers beware if you're putting that on your agenda. Maybe avoid this one. Caves in Belize are actually known as the entrance to Zibalba, these water-filled caves again, and they span as far as 300 feet. That's a massive evil front door you want to avoid right there. But you can't just grab a snorkel and frog kick your way to the underworld, it's not that easy. According to ancient Maya scripture, the Popol Vu, this path once filled with dark obstacles, and when I say dark obstacles, I mean dark. I'm talking a river filled with scorpions and blood combined with houses littered with bats and pure darkness. It's not easy to get through. It's like those haunted houses in Niagara Falls. It's really scary. This is why you don't cheat in Mayan ball games. You end up here. Do you want to be here? No. In fact, if you cheat in Monopoly, I believe you also end up here. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Stacy. 
Don't cheat. Number 10, the National Razor. What's a revolution without a little blood being spilt? Wouldn't really be a revolution, would it? France was having a hard time in the 1700s, so they needed a brand new way to get rid of pesky monarchs and anyone who isn't warming up to the revolutionary ideals. And what better way to keep people warm by cleaving their heads from their body? A man named Joseph Ignace Guillotine suggested that there was a better method for unaliving those who needed to be unalived. A common misconception is that he invented the guillotine, but rather suggested its implementation, where his name would become synonymous with such a terrible device. Basically, you got a wood frame with a hole for your noggin and a large angled blade. Blade drops down from frame and removes the head of state from the governing body, which isn't just a clever joke, as that's what happened to the last king and queen of France. By the time of its invention and the end of its use all the way up into the 1970s, yes, that's right, it was used up until the 70s, thousands of people met their doom to the National Razor. Number 9. Party Favors in the Sky When you think of air travel today, you think of lots of space for you and your fellow passengers, meals that are flavorful and affordable. Air travel in 2021 is a stress-free, very organized way to travel. But in the 1700s, these luxuries of the sky were non-existent, as there was no air travel. Any international travel was done by ship, which took months at a time and was not a pleasurable experience, opposite to what was described above. Two French brothers wanted to change this, or rather just get off the ground. The two French brothers, Montegolfier, developed and flew the first unmanned hot air balloon on September 19th, 1783. This was shortly followed up with a manned flight by Jean-Francois Pilate de Rosier. This was a very strange invention at the time, as this was really the beginning of humans and flight. Number 8. Puckle needs his gun. Ever since black powder first made it to Europe and Europeans figured out you could make big gun that go boom, people have been trying to come up with better and faster ways to make gun go boom. In the 1700s, the biggest issue with muskets and cannons at the time was reloading or getting multiple shots off. Loading black powder weapons isn't easy. I'd say ask a pirate, but you can't. Those, those kind of pirates are all, all gone now. So to fix the issue of the day, a man named James Puckle invented the very cleverly named Puckle Gun. Basically, he just added more chambers of shot rotating around one barrel. Although his idea for the time was genius, in practice, it wasn't very effective, as flintlock and black powder are really the main issue. Clumsy, lots of smoke, and does not want to work in less than fair weather conditions. Number 7. Cotton Eye Joe Dear YouTube Gods, I am sorry that history is full of not so cool things, but here at Bumblebee, I'm the Queen Bee, and I'm here to give the buzz to my sweet honeybees. So in the name of good morals, monetization, and not getting smited, I'm going to talk about your least favorite S word. Back in the 1700s, America was chillin'. They just beat Britain in a war, which alone could be its own video. They were starting to build their own country, particularly in these southern colonies using forced unpaid labor that you can't leave. Oh, and your boss can do heinous things to you because uh, he owns you. Their economy was agricultural based and stayed that way for a long time. Tobacco being the number one crop at first, cotton was still grown but wasn't as popular due to the processing of cotton being a very labor intensive and difficult process. This was until Eli Whitney's cotton gin invented in 1794. The cotton gin was a machine that quickly removed seeds and processed cotton, making cotton a very valuable crop since, you know, the people harvest seen the cotton, our YouTube's least favorite S word. It's a, it's a brutal unpaid workforce. Now that it was profitable, cotton boomed and the South became very wealthy. While not exactly the main reason, the South getting rich off Whitney's design and did somewhat create a divide between the Southern states and the Northern states, eventually leading to the Civil War. Also, apparently plantation owners didn't pay Eli for his machine and he went broke. Just trashy behavior all around, man, come on. Number six. Yes, I'm a Russian submarine commander. I actually couldn't believe this one myself, but the submarine was invented in the 1700s. Having designs and plans started in the 1500s, the first real use of a submersible vessel wasn't until 1775, named the Turtle, an acorn-shaped vessel with a crew of just one. To me, it's just hard to think that in the same century we were beginning to master flight and sea travel. I also can't stop thinking that if there was a water ride that existed, it would be pretty cool if you went underwater in like a pod, like a submarine kind of thing. Just an idea for the mouse and the corporation. Of course, it wouldn't be years until after the turtle that the submarine would see effective use. Or have a Scottish man play a Russian submarine commander in a really good movie. Russian submarine commander. Number five, 
dawn of the punch card. With the industrial revolution on the horizon, many things were about to change. Probably the most obvious at the time was factories. While not the first, Richard Arkwright's Cromford Mill in 1771 is what most resembles a modern factory today. Cromford Mill was the first water powered cotton spinning mill and initially employed 200 workers. It ran day and night with two 12 hour work shifts, the gates being locked at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., permitting no late arrivals. Oh, he likes to keep a tight schedule. Yeah, I can see the beginnings of a modern factory, all right. All you're missing is Bezos and a couple of drones to make it modern. All jokes aside, though, uh, these early factories changed the very fabric of not only Britain, but also the world. I mean, where would we be today with all that lovely pollution and those great and fair working conditions? I, I, I bet there was benefits, too. Number four, the golden liquid. You drink liquid and then it's gonna come out of you. It's simple, it's science. But sometimes other fluids need to be drained. Sometimes you can have difficulty using the little boys room. Personally, I'm still learning how to put down the toilet seat. I haven't quite figured that one out. How to make pee when a person cannot pee. Portly founding father Benjamin Franklin thought to himself as he was holding a kite in the rain. This is something I learned, which I didn't know, is that he invented the flexible catheter. Yep. Next time you feel a little weird because a tube is being inserted into a sensitive area, you can thank the man on the $100 bill. Invented in 1752 in order to aid his brother with bladder stones. It's strange though, you know, you think of a guy inventing other things, but in reality, it's a really important invention and something that's very common in the medical world today. I just hope to stay healthy long enough so no tube has to go near my founding father. Number three, pseudo cool. Okay, so back in the 1700s, food was really hard to keep. For example, meat is packed with a salty brine in order to preserve it. It either has to be shipped overseas or last long enough through a cold and brutal winter. But plans for refrigeration were being drawn up, specifically the idea of vapor compression refrigeration. Not exactly the fridge that's in your kitchen today, considering there's you know, still no main harnessing of electricity, which makes fridges run, but a brilliant idea nonetheless. While the fridge we know was still far away, it's crazy to think in the 1700s we had serious plans for one. While this was being developed, food was kept near lakes and snows in the winter. Runoffs from mountains were often used to keep drinks cool. I think this is something we all take for granted. I mean, can you imagine drinking room temperature milk or having a beef dinner that tastes saltier than salt? Looking back through history, it's interesting to see how humans persevere. As much as I love food, I don't know if I could stomach food from the past. Thank goodness we don't eat anything gross today. Hey man, uh, do you have any canned cheese left? I'm kind of hungry. Number two, ebony, ivory, living together in harmony. I honestly thought this one was older than the 1700s, but hey, here we are, invented in the year 1700 by a musically inclined Italian gentleman named Bartolomeo Cristofori. Unhappy with what was going on at the time, he decided to spice it up by changing out a few parts of some common instruments and started using little hammers that strike quickly on chords and come back in hopes they would not dampen the sound. A little fine tuning here and there and bada bing bada boom, you got a piano. I would attempt to make a joke about the piano, but let's be honest, no piano, no Elton John. No jazz, no Frank Sinatra. If you're asking me, that's a big problem. Number one, ABCs. As someone who struggles with reading, this one makes me want to hide under my covers at night. I spent countless hours as a kid learning to read and oh, Man, the phonics lessons were brutal. And thanks to this invention, I can blame it all on the 1755 invention, the English Dictionary. Yep, that's right. One of the most influential too. Written by Samuel Johnson, it took seven years to compile all the words I can't pronounce. He was commissioned 1,500 guineas for the project, which is worth about 250,000 pounds today. Until the completion of the Oxford Dictionary 173 years later, Johnson's Dictionary is considered to be the preeminent English dictionary and a huge achievement in scholarship. I mean, you gotta give the guy credit for writing this. Imagine writing an English essay for seven years. But then again, 250,000 pounds for some of my writing also sounds pretty good. All I have to do now is learn to read and write. Number 10, the bullet mouse trap. You might have heard me say that and said, what? Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mouse trap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mouse trap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mouse trap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, 
and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mousetrap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of, do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9. T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8. Nightmare Story I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, Dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. I, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll-like automaton that had clock-like gears to simulate real human movement. With the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self-defense. Or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for a woman to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item, a flask. Number 6. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst, you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah, and they're cooler than me. Oh, Yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens, but they actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number 5. I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins. A truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead. Now you are being buried alive. Have no fear friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number 4. Your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No sir! This is the age of machines. And if machines can help with one thing, it most certainly can aid in another. 
May I introduce you the Rotary Hairbrush? Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you? At the time, it kind of made sense. Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate, everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk anyone? Number 3. Full of air The Industrial Revolution changed the world, we can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic power trains? Back in the 1800s, a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air power train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the Western Tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly, the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time, and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project, as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that housed his short train. The tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number 2. Get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four-wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but Mon thinks I play too many games. Designed by FR Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off-road terrain, instead to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number 1. Bro, trust me. Everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey. But back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without. The cholera belt. What does a cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately, man. I totally need just to cleanse that space, bro. Kicking off the list at number 10, burials. This list is full of interesting objects that Neanderthals created, like tools or weapons, that kind of stuff. But the idea of burying your loved one after they've passed on, well, that had to start somewhere, didn't it? Ancient Egyptians arguably did it the best. The rich were buried with their treasure and goods because they believed that death on our world was just the start. There was another life afterwards and they would take their treasure and good stuff with them. Bye. Not leaving anything for you, I'm taking all this with me. Neanderthals didn't figure out how to build tombs yet or how to rule for decades. Studies done in Western Europe suggest that Neanderthals would sometimes bury their dead and leave flowers. Flowers or a grave marker of some sort. Pollen was found in northern Iraq's Shandir Caves. Shandir Cave is a staple when it comes to Neanderthal history. And the fact that flowers were found in the middle of a cave system, some humans and emotions are definitely at play here. This was symbolic thinking. The weather didn't make it easy to collect flowers as well. Loved ones passing during an ice age? Yeah, I'll never complain about an outdoor funeral again. Number nine, glass. Imagine making glass for the first time. You would have thought you were a wizard for sure. I watch glass blowing shows now and it looks like wizardry. Wizardry in 4K. Glass blowing is nuts. They're just like, and it's just like a vase all of a sudden. You're like, how did he do that? That's so hot. Glass that was naturally occurring, like obsidian for example, that was around and used during the Stone Age. Man-made glass was first used around 6,000 years ago. Man-made glass, yeah, let's talk about it. Archaeologists are pinning Lebanon, North Syria, and ancient Egypt as the birthplace of synthetic glass. The first use of man-made glass were beads, believe it or not. Imagine being the first person to rock beads. Ah, uh, the confidence. Mid-2000 BC, guy decides to glaze up some beads. What an icon. Now we get to do this. The beads, it's a cool door. Number eight, sharpen stones. Some of the oldest tools in history could be laying in front of you and you would have zero idea. You have no clue. Coming from the shores of Lake Tucana in Kenya, these stone tools date back to around three million years ago. 
Yeah, these are predating the tools before that I mentioned by like 700,000 years. They seem to predate humans in the Homo genus as well, so that's interesting, that's kind of concerning. The volcanic ash and minerals around these sharpened stones date back that far, millions of years old. Stones in history can get a little dirty, to say the least. Not all these ideas that involve stones or sharpened stones are the best. French anthropologist Philippe Charlier shared toilet hygiene history in the British Medical Journal. Perhaps one of the most intriguing parts explains how these flat terracotta discs were found in ancient Greek sites and they had residue on them. They had a certain residue on these sharp rocks. They used to with these stones, yeah. They also discovered a Greek cup which said three stones are enough to wipe one's arse. Three? I don't know, that's at least five, my friend. Greeks would use stones to wipe. Never take the go for granted ever again. Number seven, axes. The Neolithic period, also referred to as the New Stone Age, introduced us to many vital tools that we still use today. Like an axe, for example. Around 10,000 BC, Neanderthals moved from being these small hunter-gatherer type groups to these much larger settlements. In order to do so, you had to clear a lot of land. Humans evolved at this point in history because that's when we went from flaking stones to grinding them down entirely. We put a little more elbow grease in in order to clear those trees out to build a settlement or two or three or five. Neolithic axes were found at sites in England and Denmark. This one here was found in great condition, alarmingly great condition, like look at this thing. It was uncovered during archeological surveys for a tunnel project in Denmark. Imagine finding a 5,500 year old ax in the middle of your shift. And in case you're wondering, the lack of oxygen in the surrounding clay is the reason why the wooden handle was preserved so well. It almost seems like it was placed there as some type of offering. My first thought is that it's for sure belonging to the Odin Thor family. I don't know, it's, it's placed downwards, you know what I mean? No one touch it. Number six, spears and arrows. Perhaps one of the most vital inventions, one we for sure still use today, always, of course. Arrows and spears were a necessity when it came to hunting, and for people in the Stone Age, all they needed really was wood. They would carve a leaf shape at the end or a triangle at the tip, and then they were mainly used by riders or barefoot hunters. But when it came to hunting, you didn't want to get too close to your prey, or else the wrong team could be claiming victory and eat the other for lunch. You get what I'm saying? So their solution was to huck these spears instead, or make really tiny ones that you can throw or shoot. The oldest bows in history are from 9000 BC. They're the home guard bows. They're found in Northern Europe all the way back from the Mesolithic period. The oldest spears, however, they come from Germany around 400,000 years ago, and they're actually the oldest wooden artifacts ever in history. Imagine being the first person to make a spear. Forget iPhones, a spear? That's a big deal. Number five, flutes. We love a solid flutist. They're flutists, right? Flutest? Uh, dude, I've always wanted to play the flute. Pied Piper, that guy is daring, that guy is wild. He runs around town and plays the jazz flute all day long in tights. Of course I want to be like that, mostly, he's got some flaws. But who is the first person to bust out We Three Kings? Who do we have to blame for all those horrible recorder classes in elementary school? I was the one kid next to you, you're like, drain the spit, it's not on properly. Cover your, use that pinky, cover your thing up. The first instrument known to man was most likely our vocal cords, but the second instrument were the flutes of Glycine Coastal Cave. They're the oldest musical instruments that have ever been discovered. They were made from bird bone and the ivory of a mammoth. Yeah, so that's an indication how old they are. They made music out of mammoth ivory. That's old. Brass? Like, no, 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 we haven't found that yet. Number four, paintings. Yeah, why not? Let's include art into this mix. Who was the first person to create art? The Lascaux Caves have been dubbed the prehistoric Sistine Chapel. These cave paintings are from 17,000 years ago and they're beautiful. But if you're thinking about sneaking down there to write Jordan was here, well, you better think again. The cave was opened originally in 1948, but due to carbon dioxide levels and sweat from visitors and just people breathing and being around, it was closed in 1963. You can't be breathing on our prehistoric paintings. Get your morning dad breath out of here, sir. We don't want that. Look how beautiful it is. It's really nice. <sighs> Learning about our history is challenging, but it's slowly fading away. We're breathing on it all day long, but these caves in France are not home to the oldest paintings in the world, believe it or not. Altamira Cave in Spain houses cave paintings from 35,000 years ago. The paintings were in such great condition that at first scientists doubted that they were the real deal from that long ago. But in 1902 they were marked as the real deal. These ochre and charcoal images are the most well preserved on the planet. Meanwhile, I'm over here still drawing the sun in the corner of my page. Number three. Blades. Around 80,000 years ago, the first ever five o'clock shadow appeared. 
And it wasn't my family. We didn't, we don't have those. An upper Paleolithic stone tool tradition came from Neanderthals and also the first modern human. It's a big deal. This method here was to shave up your face so you're not, you know, eating your own mustache for dinner. And it was entirely new to the game. During this process, Neanderthals would often break off these sharp flakes from the core of a large stone and then use those chips as blades. Horrible, just imagining that. The Aurignacian culture, appropriately named after the French village of Aurignac, where Neanderthal remains were found back in 1860, this culture is the first modern human in Europe. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, we had to use seashells. And when I say seashells to get rid of hair, I don't mean they would, you know, glide across the skin or anything like that. They would use two shells, then use them together as tweezers. Yeah, one by one. Seashells, can you imagine? That's horrible. Can you hear that? That's the sound of our ancestors plucking their unibrow. Sounds painful, right? Ah, uh, yes, it was. Trapping clamshells were later used in the 19th century because we realized if they're flat enough, we could probably just swipe off the hair. It saved a lot of time. Still horrible, but we saved a lot of time. We figured it out. Number two, the wheel. One of the greatest inventions of all time, and now all we want is hover cars. How disrespectful, we just got this thing. The wheel, the idea of the wheel is unlike any other. See, most inventors are inspired by nature. Planes, submarines, bullet trains, all has something to do with nature, bird beaks, flying, underwater, all that crap. Nothing in nature resembles a wheel at all. The closest thing really are tumbleweeds and dung beetles. My favorite thing to mention on this uh, channel, the poop rollers. Potter wheels were found from Mesopotamia around 5,500 years ago. Now it's hard to pinpoint who used the wheel first and where, I mean, given the fact that it was that long ago, but the front runners so far aside from Mesopotamia are the Tripoli people of modern Ukraine because the word wheel literally is derived from their language, but the wheelbarrow may have appeared in ancient Greece around 600 BCE. They say you can't reinvent the wheel, but I feel like you can. At least this early in time, I feel like we did. Number one, fire. Fire. Course. I mean, next to the wheel, this one was, you know, it's pretty important, I'd say. When was fire first used in history? Well, a study done in 2011 was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science, and it showed that Neanderthals were firebenders. Not really, no. They were just, after carefully examining over 140 fireplace sites in Europe, the University of Colorado Boulder found some stone artifacts and charcoal dating back to 400,000 years ago. Now, of course, these fireplaces were used to cook meals, but at the same time, tools were created during this process. Melting things and moving them around, kind of like glass blowing, heat makes things come to life. Neanderthals would use something called pitch. Pitch was made by burning the bark of birch trees. It allowed them to attach stones to wooden shaft, which is a pretty big deal when it came to hammers and tools. Inventing glue is one thing, but doing it while you're working the barbecue? Whose dad was that? That's impressive, that's so impressive. Guys making tools while making lunch. 